Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Stroke Identification and Triage with Dr. Jankowitz and Dr. Zacharados from the Hackensack Meridian Neuroscience Institute at JFK University Medical Center. If you have any questions, you may ask them anonymously by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, but please note that if you type it into the chat, it will not be anonymous and all attendees will be able to see your question. We will make sure that all questions are answered at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and sent to the email address that you registered with, along with being uploaded to the Hackensack Meridian Health YouTube channel. Thank you again for joining us today, and I will pass the floor over to Dr. Jankowitz and Dr. Zacharados. Good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, I'm honored to be with my partner, Dr. Zacharados, as we discuss today some of the basics about stroke triage and diagnosis. A little bit about myself. I'm a surgeon trained at the University of Pittsburgh. I trained along the full spectrum of neurosurgical care, brain tumors and spine trauma, uh, but I fell in love with treating blood vessels. And I'm lucky enough to, to have been taught how to treat blood vessels or how to, how to uh, cure or treat blood vessels from the outside in with standard surgical uh, techniques. But then I did special training to learn how to treat blood vessels from the inside out, a technique or, or a trait that, that unites uh, Dr. Z and myself. So, we bring to the table a, a neurosurgical perspective like myself, once again, treating blood vessels from the outside in and the inside out, and then the neurological perspective from Dr. Zachary Rogers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jankowitz. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you as our partner here at, at JFK uh, to combine and complement from an open neurosurgical approach, as well as from an a intravascular or inside the blood vessel approach. A little bit about myself, I'm a neurologist, who also has a passion to work inside the blood vessels uh, for acute stroke care, aneurysms, so vascular malformations. Um, that's the, the passion and the, the fire that unites us both, uh, making us such an effective team, as you'll see through this presentation. So today we'll walk you through the different initial presentation, uh, treatment, as well as effective modification to treat the acute ischemic stroke. And you have a unique view um, Probably just hear or verbalize. So, look forward to uh, spending this hour with you. I'm, I'm called a neurologist all the time, and I take that as a, as a profound honor. Maybe you can talk a little bit about so, what separates us? We unite by a passion about blood vessels, and then we both learn to treat blood vessels from the inside out. But what special skills do you have that I could never hope to attain? I think I should reverse that. Uh, I, I am obstructed by this barrier called the skull. And uh, if you want me to go into the blood vessel, I can go through the skin and the wrist, the radial artery, or the arm, or the leg. But I still have never really, uh, developed the, the techniques and the years of specific special training to access the skull. Otherwise, we uh, share a very uh, complementary, complementary overlapping. Yeah, I think you're too shy to, to comment on the fact that a neurologist, I think, can, can care for a patient from cradle to grave. They can treat all manner of their, their, their medical issues. And then a subset of neurologists like Dr. Z can treat them from their surgical issues as well. And, and I've often felt that the, the best vascular programs are built on the shoulders. Sorry, I'm just going to turn off this cell. The best, the best vascular program are built on the shoulders of vascular neurologists. We need that foundation of great medical doctors on which to build a surgical practice. So I think that we, we, we do things very independently, but also have a, quite a lot of complementary skills. So with that, I'm going to go on to our lecture. So as you hear the, the words ischemic stroke or stroke, it's a, to somebody that has never experienced or visualized a stroke on an imaging study, we want to give you a foundation for what a stroke appears like on an MRI. To the right of the screen, you see an arrow uh, pointing to a bright area of the brain. 
So number one, this is a, a visualization of a brain on an MRI. And that bright area represents the area that is damaged as a result of lack of oxygenated blood. And the analogy I like to give to people is when you jump into a water, into a pool of water, and you, you submerge yourself, the amount of time you stay underwater is directly dependent on how much time your body needs that oxygen. So a stroke means that a certain blood vessel or blood vessel territory is blocked because of a blood clot has stopped the forward progression of oxygenated blood to the brain. And this is what you see translate into an MRI. Yes, sadly, that bright area constitutes hundreds of millions of neurons that are permanently disabled or dead. And so this is a profound change to the way a person can think, feel, and act. And our job every day is simply to save neurons. That's our, our, our single defining goal. To give a foundation for what the brain does, this is a different important areas of the brain. Uh, when you talk about the right side and the left side of the brain, the majority of people, let's say over 90% of people are dominant with their left side of their brain. And when you block off certain blood vessels, you affect certain specific functions. And I thought this picture basically summarizes very nicely the basic functions of the brain. So from the top, you see the cerebral cortex. Um, it involves the perception, spatial awareness, uh, spelling and manipulating objects. You have different areas, such as Wernicke's area, that when the certain blood vessels are blocked, it affects the ability to speak or understand the comprehension and the language. And you have something called the Broca's areas. Can I speak articulately? Um, then the frontal lobe is involved in planning and organizing personality. But at the basic level, the, the left side of the brain controls the right arm, right leg, and the right face, as well as the thinking. The right side of the brain affects the left face, left arm, and left leg. This is a visualization to give you a frame of reference for what the blood vessels in our neck look like. The base is the common carotid artery. And then the further up, you see the bifurcation, which is the internal carotid artery bifurcation and the internal carotid artery. What this basically does, there are these two blood vessels in our necks that provide the blood supply to both sides of our brain. And that sums it up. You know, we have four blood vessels that bring blood to our brain, two carotid arteries and two vertebral arteries. So you see there represents a quarter of the, of the blood vessels that bring blood to the brain. As an extension of that, then you see here what it actually looks like, the blood vessels look like on each half of the brain. So you have the middle cerebral artery and its different branches. And you have the anterior cerebral artery and its different branches. Something else we'd like to point out to you are the lenticulostriate arteries. All of these are very important blood vessels that provide blood and oxygenated blood to the brain. And that's what allows us to have the different function that we have on a daily basis. When you stop that forward flow of oxygenated blood to that part of the brain is when it becomes very obvious someone is having a problem. And we'll talk about the ischemic stroke and the hemorrhagic stroke. So ischemia means a lack of oxygenated blood. Hemorrhagic means a bleeding type of problem. It's important for us to understand this complex roadmap of blood vessels. Because only by knowing what a normal blood vessel looks like to the brain can we identify the problematic or pathological strokes that we see? So if we bring a patient into our, our angio suite and we do an angiogram to, to map out the blood vessels, we need to be able to identify where the brain is not getting blood to try and open up those occluded vessels. 
I really want you to focus in on the lenticulostriate arteries as well, because we will talk about later the risk factor modification. Something else to notice are the diameters of these blood vessels. The diameters of the lenticulostriate arteries are too thin for our advanced technology to get into. However, some of the other larger blood vessels allow us to advance our advanced technology. And Dr. Jenk, would you think our technology has advanced or regressed over the years since you started doing these interventions? I, I think that there are more unanswered questions left in neurosciences, and yet we've seen technology advanced by leaps and bounds every single year. So. I have a new tool to use almost on a monthly basis, and as and as for as many tools as we have here in the U.S., we have twice as many outside the U.S. that are being developed and, and, and being trialed in small patient populations. It's an exciting time, and I feel like we can treat just about anything safer and faster and as effectively, often as open surgery, than ever before. Absolutely. This is an example of the blood vessel that is the basilar artery. Uh, Dr. Jankowicz talked about the internal carotids, two of them, and then we also have the vertebral arteries, which we have two sort of in the back of our necks. And the major blood vessel is the basilar artery. And this is what a normal blood vessel example looks like. Some facts just to think about, nearly 800,000 people in the United States have a stroke every year. On average, someone in the United States has a stroke every 40 seconds, and every four minutes, someone will die of complications or directly related to a stroke. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. However, worldwide, it's the second leading cause of death. So for as much advancement as we've had in the United States, there still becomes a significant hurdle to overcome from a professional and industry standpoint to protect worldwide our patient populations. Yeah. You know, I'd like to believe that, that some of the life-saving maneuvers that we've been trained to do has allowed that stroke to fall in the leading cause of death, but there's much to be done worldwide. Stroke is a leading cause of long-term disability and a leading preventable cause of disability. And that's exactly because it affects the different parts of the brain and it shuts the functions down. And each person is independent for how he or she may be able to tolerate some of that lack of oxygenated blood. And that's where really the next idea comes in. When it comes to a stroke, time matters. So as soon as the identification of the stroke is made, how quickly that person comes to the hospital, gets the appropriate treatment they need is a direct function to how well they do. So your immediate action can help prevent brain damage and long-term disability. Yeah, we, we spend so much time in the US talking about heart attacks and what to do if you notice someone having a chest pain or a heart attack. Well, we're trying to, to reframe it as a brain attack. Time matters, and you can make a huge difference in how much, how many neurons we can save in a patient if you can get them to us in a timely fashion. So how do you spot a stroke? Uh, Jack, uh -huh. So there are a number of ways to, to evaluate a patient to see if they're having a stroke. We have, we have these acronyms such as BFAST or the RACE scale or the NIH stroke scale to provide a systematic and organized way to evaluate somebody if you think they may, they may be having a stroke. And we agree that BFAST is probably the easiest way sort of in the community to learn how to identify the signs and symptoms of a stroke. So B for balance, just if someone appears to exhibit acute, a really instantaneous in coordination of their arms or legs. E is for eye. So it can stand for both blurry vision or acute loss of vision, like a shade is being pulled down over the pupil, but also if you notice that the eyes have a gaze or if the eyes appear forced or fixed to one side of the face, a very common finding in someone that has a, that has a major active stroke going on. For the face, it's looking for 
asymmetry. You know, the beauty of the body is that, is that it's perfectly balanced like a butterfly. So when you see any asymmetry, that usually is evidence that something's going on in the brain causing the contralateral side of the body to be affected. So not only can you develop weakness of the face, you can develop weakness of the arms or legs. And then finally, particularly if it's on the left side, you can develop troubles with understanding speech or communicating by expressing speech. And then finally, the T and B fast, time. Time is brain. It is essential that if you suspect any one of these uh, signs or symptoms in a, in a friend that you want to call 911 and get help immediately. And then we trust the EMS or pre-hospital services to get the right patient to the right place as fast as possible. It's, it's very fascinating to be on the receiving end of patients that come in, especially with these large strokes, because uh, sometimes they'll come in where they're completely paralyzed, but then you'll hear their family say, no, my loved one said he or she lost their vision on, on their eye. And that, that really comes into the eye component because if you lose that vision in the eye, it usually the vision is black completely. But that's an indicator that a person may have a 90 degree or a greater than 90 degree stenosis in their carotid artery. And it usually foreshadows something. So just this education uh, is, is so uh, important and powerful just to get that person to the right doctor as soon as they can. So if, if you go on websites, you're going to see all sorts of, of scary schematics and cartoons uh, to depict what it looks like when someone's having a stroke. But I think it's essential that you see what it looks like when someone's having an active stroke. So this was a patient of mine that had an MCA occlusion who presented to my angio suite. And this is this patient in real life having an active stroke. And we just wanted to point out things that you might be able to determine based on that BFAST exam. Can you open your eyes? So the first thing you may notice is the patient has the right gaze preference. He's opening his eyes and immediately his eyes are forced to the right side. When you have a stroke, particularly a major stroke in a large artery, you tend to look towards the side of the stroke. This is what it's so exciting. Within five seconds of seeing this patient and asking them one question, I know with a pretty high certainty that he has a large blood vessel occlusion on the right side of the brain that I can probably help open up. The eyes are the window. Can you show me your teeth? So now that the story is presenting itself. So we assume that the patient has a stroke on the right side of the brain. Eyes are going to look towards the right side, but because the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, you expect him to have a left sided facial weakness, left arm, and left leg weakness. And here you see a very profound weakness of the left side of the mouth, whereas he can show his teeth on the right side. Raise your eyebrows. Okay. Some of the facial muscles actually tend to retain symmetry, so raising the eyebrows usually remains, uh, remains normal. I also want you to appreciate just how comfortable he is. You know, a real problem about a stroke is it's painless. The beauty of a heart attack is people are terrified and they seek immediate medical attention. But when someone has a stroke, the vast majority of the time, they're cool, calm, collected, and without pain. And unfortunately, this means that many people don't seek help because they either don't know what's going on or they're not experiencing pain and they don't need relief. Can you wiggle your fingers? Raise your arms up in the air. Again, that's the right side of the brain, which can affect the left arm. So his right arm is perfectly normal. However, his left arm has to be called flat as well. What you also know is that he can understand oral language. I'm speaking to him, asking him to follow commands. So that makes sense. Language is, is often on the left side of the brain, or, uh, and, and motor function of the left, of the left side of the body tends to focus on the right side. He understands language, but he still can't move the right side. Relax. Can you wiggle these fingers? Uh, 
Can you wiggle your toes? And then finally, we see that his left leg is also uh, paralyzed. The question is, is this permanent or temporary? And is there something that we can do for this patient? Because just 15 years ago, this patient would be pushed to the back of the ER, given an aspirin, given oxygen, given an, an IV fluid, and then we would have watched that stroke completely evolve and then focused on rehab. But I think there's more that we can do today. So the different types of strokes that we have, the vast majority are the ischemic stroke types. That's when a blood clot is blocking the forward movement of oxygenated blood. So ischemic stroke just means I'm not getting enough oxygen to the brain. And then you have the minority of stroke, the 13% of the hemorrhagic type of strokes or intracranial hemorrhage. At a basic level, it just means blood is outside of the normal course of the blood vessels and it's the blood is actually spilled into the brain. Both can be equally as devastating. Both can present in a very similar fashion and both time matters as to how fast you bring the person in because it directly impacts how somebody does. Then you have another word that you hear and people throw out called TIAs. TIAs are basically temporary neurologic changes, and that's because something may have been blocking that blood vessel, but technically, a TIA, the person has the problem, then the problem goes away. There's no MRI change related to that change. However, it's a foreshadow for something significant to come, and you should not ignore a TIA symptoms. Approximately 240,000 events per year in the United States, and we don't want to miss even those patients because sometimes you can identify a large vessel narrowing or a blood clot that's sort of sitting and allowing blood to flow around there. So you really want to get evaluated as soon as possible. This is such an important point. Not only, as we showed, can strokes be completely painless, so when you're having an active stroke, you might not seek help, but so often we hear stories of people who had a transient event, then they got completely better, and they went on with their daily life, and then days or weeks or months later, they had a catastrophic stroke that could have been prevented. So when you hear of this, whether it's a friend, a family member, or an acquaintance, if you hear that they had a transient event that sounds like a stroke, that sounds like some of the symptoms we talked about, but it got better, that is the time to seek help because those are the patients that we can probably do the most for to prevent any stroke from occurring. Absolutely right. This is an example of a CAT scan and what a brain looks like. To your right is the normal side of the brain and that's actually the left side of the brain. Your left is the abnormal area. That bright area means that blood has escaped the small blood vessels that feed that area, and that is what calls, is called intracranial hemorrhage, or a bleeding type of stroke. And this can be equally as devastating, leading to paralysis or confusion, otherwise called aphasia, or even as simple as just tingling. But anything that's abnormal, you want to have a high index of suspicion and bring that person or your loved one to the hospital. Here's another example of a left thalamic hemorrhage. You know, this, this disease process is near and dear to my heart because while we focused on ischemic stroke, you know, a plumbing problem, you have a clock right, for the last 15 years, we knew that there was a whole, whole other territory to delve into because even though hemorrhagic stroke makes up only about 13% of all strokes throughout the U.S., the outcomes tend to be even worse than ischemic stroke. So we've made incredible strides about how to cure, how to completely reverse some ischemic strokes. But we really hadn't focused much attention on, on ICH, intracranial hemorrhage. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about, about the ability now, more so than ever, of being able to get blood out of the brain to enhance and augment recovery, to really give people the best shot at this recovery that they can possibly get. So this is a patient, once again, with a left-sided thalamic intracranial hemorrhage. And we've developed new devices because the whole idea was we need to get that blood out of the brain. 
profoundly believe that if we can get that blood out of the brain, not only can we stop the ongoing injury, but then we prevent this secondary injury. Because blood is irritating wherever it is, whether it's in the brain, whether it's in the GI system. It tends to initiate this, these secondary inflammatory mediators that cause, that, cause, that cause injury and damage to wherever the, the blood is days to weeks afterwards. So if we can eliminate that blood, we can stop the damaging process in its tracks. The problem is that with open surgical techniques, some of the classic ways we did brain surgery, we would cause as much harm as benefit. But now we have new slick ways to get in the brain. So this is a working channel endoscope. All it is, it's a camera and a light source on a stick. And that stick is pretty narrow. It's about the thickness of a yellow number two pencil. So if I can get this yellow number two pencil into a hematoma, into a blood clot in the brain, now I can evacuate that hematoma within minutes and try and stop the damage and give these patients the best chance of recovery. So once again, this is just a lighted camera on a stick. And through that light on a stick, I can advance these new, uh, these new machines like the Nico Myriad. And all it is is this Pac-Man chewer at the tip of a very narrow straw that I can put down that camera and chew up blood. And this is what it looks like. So on the periphery, so that is the catheter or plastic straw that I've navigated into the hematoma or blood clot. Then you can see all the red coagulated blood. And it's pretty tenacious. When, when blood clots, it becomes pretty sticky and it's hard to get out. So you need something to chew it. And you'll see this little Pac-Man morselator chewing this blood. When we're sucking and chewing up the blood clot, getting into these pockets of liquefied blood. And over time, as we remove that blood, we end up with this beautiful picture. So this is that same cavity at the end of the hematoma evacuation. And now you're going to see this relaxed, pulsatile brain. Now, there are, there's a little bit of red staining the blood on the surface of the brain, but that's relatively inconsequential. We've taken out all the mass effect of that blood. And now you can see the surface of the brain in ways we've never seen before through these high-definition cameras in the middle of the, of the blood clot, pulsating and happy and ready for recovery. So that, that truly is fascinating to have that unique view because from a neurologist standpoint, I see the CAT scan before, which is to your left and to the right after Dr. Jankowicz absorbs and evacuates that hemorrhage. That's what we see afterwards. That's fascinating. Yeah, you know, it's it, all too often while ischemic stroke gets all the attention, hemorrhagic stroke or intracranial hemorrhage often doesn't, it often isn't met with the same urgency as an, as, a, as an ischemic stroke. But with this new technology, in our minds, all stroke, all ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke should be triaged every bit as fast because now we have more therapeutic options. So to take this hematoma, completely evacuate it, I, I, I truly believe that we're going to we're going to allow these patients to have better outcomes than we've ever seen. What's a good optimal time for uh, evacuation? Of blood you know, we don't know. Uh, we have evidence to show that it can be beneficial out to 96 hours, but it probably should be treated like an acute ischemic stroke. If you can stop the ongoing damage as early as possible within minutes to hours, that probably is going to lead to the best possible outcomes. Amazing. Uh, these are the different types of strokes that we can uh, we deal with. You have something called a thrombotic kind of stroke. And what you'll notice is a yellow plaque. And the plaque is just a cholesterol buildup that occurs over a person's lifetime that creates a situation where a blood clot can form. And it basically starves that area of the brain from oxygenated blood flow. Then the next one is an embolic type of stroke where a blood clot, like a spitball, very much like a spitball, blocks the blood flow. And then that's the things that we can remove. You have a lacuna type of stroke. And earlier we focused on the lenticulostriates. 
those very, very thin hair-like diameter blood vessels. And that's what a lacunar type of stroke affects. And you have an intracerebral hemorrhage. That's what Dr. Jankowicz was just demonstrating, uh, the evacuation. And now you have a very unique view of what the inside the blood of, in the brain looks like and then what the brain after the evacuation of the blood looks like. And then you have something called a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And oftentimes you'll hear of somebody having an aneurysm inside the brain, an intracranial aneurysm, which is something that has been developing over time. And the damage that an intracranial aneurysm can cause is varied. But what's the most common presentation that you've seen? For, an brain, for brain aneurysm? Yeah. It's very simple. The worst headache of your life. Uh, if, if, if I hear those words, that patient has a ruptured aneurysm until proven otherwise. And every bit as much as, as an acute MI, a heart attack, an ischemic stroke, that patient should be rushed to the hospital for further evaluation. It usually starts with something as simple as a CAT scan. Absolutely. So we'll focus now on acute neurologic change related to an ischemic stroke. And oftentimes, the first most important thing is to get that person to the hospital because one of the first questions that's going to be asked of you and your loved ones, when was the last normal of the person? Because we want to be able to offer that person the maximal treatment. And it starts with blood pressure management, but it also starts with the IV administration of something called TPA or tenecteplase, which is meant to dissolve this acutely formed blood clot. And you have up to four and a half hours where someone like myself and Dr. Jenkins has up to four and a half hours to administer this medicine from the IV. So that's why it's so important to bring that person in as soon as possible. This is a very nice representation of what the blood vessels look like when you have an embolic type of stroke. That means a clot has led to the occlusion of the blood flow. And actually, they threw a curveball. They added some clot, but here comes the clot that's going to occlude this narrowed segment. And then you're going to see that someone gave them IV tenecteplase or TPA that's in the blue purple color, and it's going to dissolve this very fibrin rich thrombus. And that's the benefit. So you, you want to make sure you try to get that person within four and a half hours of symptoms onset to try to get give the best opportunity. But Dr. Jankowicz, do you find that these clots sometimes dissolve that fast? Uh, you know, it's irrelevant because by the American Heart Association guidelines, if a patient presents within four and a half hours, they are uh, they should be administered this medicine. However, because a significant amount of the, of the clots don't dissolve, we always approach it in a parallel fashion. So while we're administering the medicine, we're thinking about whether they need an approach to take out something that might be a clot even larger. You know, the clot-busting drug like TPA and TNK, it works wonderfully for microscopic clots. Yes. But it doesn't work well for large or long clots. The clot-busting drug just can't intercalate. It just can't uh, diffuse into these large clots. So that's where the specialized training that Dr. Zakharatos and I got come in handy. So we're going to show a video of what it looks like to try and pull out a long clot. And to give you a, an example, this is about, about the size of a, of, a, of a standard garden worm, about two to two and a half millimeters in diameter, anywhere from a centimeter to four centimeters in length. So we'll see if that problems and just don't do well as well. Blocking the forward of the blood. To the area of the blood clot. To cross the area of the blood clot so we can deploy our technology to try to drag out the clot. Here is uh, another term, is a stent 
retriever. There's a variety of technologies that are out there, but the purpose of it is to integrate the clot inside the stent retriever and then take another catheter that we can aspirate or use a complementary vacuum to kneel open that blood flow. Now you have the reestablishment of the normal blood flow. And again, the blood flow represents oxygen to the brain. Or we deploy a stent that was permanent and we had to leave it behind in the blood vessel. What we notice is that that clots are very sticky. They like to stick to things like stents. So if you can get a retrievable stent and put it in the clot, that clot tends to stick to the stent, and then you can pull out the stent with the clot attached to it. Not just fragmenting the clot, but removing it completely Absolutely. for high quality, complete recanalization. But you know, there are other ways to skin a cat. Absolutely. So actually one of my favorite ways to remove a, a hematoma is to simply aspirate it. The simplicity and elegance of what we call aspiration thrombectomy is highlighted here. You see a large hollow tube with some metal at the tip and just pulling in this large clot. What's really interesting about this catheter and is, is highlighted by new technology is that the catheter tip is a bit spongy. As the clot interfaces with it, it can actually expand a little bit to engulf that clot. We so call this the hippo aspiration catheter because it very much functions like, like a hippo expanding its mouth and closing it on the, on the uh, intravascular blood clot. Well, I was going to say it's fascinating. Each acute stroke patient or person with an acute ischemic stroke, there's never a cookie cutter way to approach somebody like this because the vast technology that we have, you have to visualize the anatomy, understand what target, what size of the, the blood clot you're dealing with or narrow or stenosis. And then you're deploying the advanced technology that we have available to us. Yeah, I, I think it's important to have every technology at your fingertips. And I'm proud of HMH and JFK. We want for nothing by and large. Mm -hmm. We have five different stent retrievers depending on the type of clot, the length of the clot or how solid it is. We have about six or seven different aspiration catheters of, of varying sizes and length, depending on how big the vessel is and how distal we need to go. So I really feel like we have every tool to make this job as easy and safe for the patient That's as possible. Awesome. So it gives the patient the full advantage of full recovery. All right, so we'll come full circle. So this, once again, this was my patient many years ago who presented with a right MC occlusion. And I went up and aspirated the clot, pulled the clot out, and this is our final outcome. Open your eyes. Raise your eyebrows. Can you open your eyes? Can you show me your teeth? Stick out your tongue. Can you show me your teeth? Can you raise your arms up? Raise your eyebrows. Can you wiggle your fingers? Can you wiggle your fingers? And bring your arms down. Raise your arms up in the air. Can you wiggle your toes? Can you raise that left Relax. leg up in the air? Excellent. Can you wiggle your fingers? I could watch this video every day on the block. It never ceases to amaze me how profoundly we can affect patients' lives. Mm -hmm. And I train to do, like I said, the full gambit of brain tumors and spinal trauma. But there is nothing that I am proud of than opening up blood vessels and giving someone's life. He's sitting here chilling in the recovery room three hours after the procedure with a completely different outlook on life. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm in my 40s. He was in his early 40s. And now instead of being relegated to a nursing home for, for probably at least two months and probably never having a fully functional job or at least being living one. He is he has recovered to about ninety eight percent of his full uh, full capacity and full capable function. And, and I will tell you, um, is this a typical response that you see after a thrombectomy? No, no. I listen. We, we have complications. I've certainly hurt people, but I have helped far more uh, than than I've hurt. And while every patient doesn't have such a dramatic recovery as this patient. 
the vast majority get better to some extent. It's all about stopping the stroke in progress and converting what would have been a life-ending or life-disabling stroke to something smaller and recoverable. Right. And oftentimes after a thrombectomy, it can be as fast, and I think time has taught me this, be as fast as we can ever do it. A person has been identified in the house, in the house and they've brought through the EMS, they've gotten the IV medicine, they were brought to the uh, IR angio suite to get the treatment as fast as possible. And that person did not have the collateral blood supply. So each person is slightly different in terms of how quick they recover. And so that recovery that Dr. Jenk was demonstrating is amazing. And we have seen it, that, that's not the typical response, uh, but it's, it's the technology that has allowed us to go so fast and have these beautiful outcomes that has really changed and impacted patient care. So you said time is brain. So we know that, right. yes, if patients can get here within seconds, minutes, or hours, that's gonna likely give them a better shot at recovery. But what about on the back end? Is there a time period that's too long to treat someone? I think the more and more research that is done uh, over the years, we really, are not placing time as a metric. We're looking at what does the CAT scan look like? And the CAT scan looks like if it's salvageable brain tissue with different advanced technologies, then we are proactive because we know a person does better with oxygenated blood supply to that part of the brain versus leaving it alone. And there are certain people that we are reminded of it because we have a unique viewpoint where you say, well, Maybe it's too long and we still do the removal of the clot or otherwise known as a thrombectomy and you see the improvement and it brings chills to your body. You say, wow, how many people in the past have we actually passed on? Uh, but now because of the advanced data, using all the information within our uh, societies, I think we are more and more going after more of these blood clots and giving people the best opportunity for survival and improvement in their day-to-day -day quality of life. And here, it just reminds me, sometimes we have older population, over 90. And the family will tell me, well, doc, should we? And I say, you know, sometimes if you never try it, you know. And if you don't do it, you'll know 100% of the time that that person will not do well. But it's remarkable when you move that clot and then you start seeing that person move and come to the clinic later on and shuffling in, walking in, and you just change the, the person's out, outlook on life, and whereas they may not have had that otherwise. So that's, that's powerful. All right, so what's the oldest patient you've treated? Oldest, uh, 96. I got you, 99. Nice. Now, now that, that may seem you know, concerning when you talk about utilization of health resources, but point of fact, the older a patient is, the greater the treatment effect that they obtain, meaning that pound for pound, an 80 or 90 year old will get more benefit from opening up a clogged blood vessel than a younger patient, simply because even a very small stroke in an older patient can cause a lifetime of disability or, or a life ending small stroke. So I would tell you that I have no cap on, on the age of someone that I'm going to treat. There's no time window outside of which I'm unwilling to treat. So I think. Everyone deserves a chance, and sometimes it's only with some specialized imaging that can be put on the hospital. Do we know if they truly can't be salvaged? So don't give up on patients. Everyone deserves a chance at either evacuating a hematoma out of their brain or opening up the clot buttons. Absolutely. Uh, this is another example of a reason somebody may have a stroke. To the left hand side, you see a carotid artery that has a cholesterol buildup that built up over the course of the life person. And so the risk factors here are just genetics, uh, more often than not tobacco dependence or smoking, uh, but that's causing a 90% channel of, of blood flow that's there. That person developed um, a very significant stroke affecting the right side of the body. We were re able to reopen up that area by putting a stent, which you see in the middle part of the screen, and reopening the panel. So it improves the forward flow of blood, uh, allowing that person to have a reduction in the risk. 
of, of having another stroke as a result of that stenosis. Yeah. So not only reestablishing blood flow, but by trapping that plaque, that debris against the blood vessel wall, it prevents it from distally embolizing as well. But see, this is where uh, that complementary training is very important because this is from inside the blood vessel that I can do. But Dr. Jenkowitz has a, another complementary skill that is able to clean out that blood vessel. Yeah, so we, we talked about treating blood vessels from the inside out, which are just basics. So we have that. We're treating blood vessels from the outside in, like the position in the neck, a sec down to the to the artery, open up the artery and literally clean it out uh, from the outside and then sew it back up. Uh, it's a procedure called a carotid endarterectomy. And I think there's a perfect procedure for everybody. The human body is so different for every patient that I think that a stent, whether done transfemorally or transradially, or a carotid endarterectomy, needs to be on the uh, on the on the on the spectrum of services that you provide to make sure that you provide the best treatment for every individual patient. Just individualized medicine. Absolutely. So what to expect after someone's admitted to the hospital? Well, we, we identify the cause of the stroke because by this point, the person has been evaluated for IV TPA or IV tenecteplase. Basically, that's the IV clot busting or melting away clot medicine. Then you have been screened for an evaluation for treatment from inside the blood vessel that Dr. Jankowitz and I perform. But then we also admit you to the neurocritical care unit, then you get evaluated for why did the stroke occur and different technologies that we work with. Uh, you get put on a heart monitor or telemetry. We look for specifically for atrial fibrillation or are there other heart rhythms that may be causing you to have a problem causing a blood clot. We look at the heart function using a transthoracic echocardiogram or a transesophageal echocardiogram, looking for the ejection fraction. How much can the heart squeeze? Is this the squeeze of the heart strong or is it reduced? When it's reduced, blood can sort of sit in the heart, allow a blood clot to form, much like if you cut meat in a plate and you set aside that plate, you form a gelatin uh, in the that's what we see when we remove the clot from the blood vessel. Sometimes a, a person can have a weak heart because of a coronary artery disease or other reasons. Uh, somebody can have an underlying cancer. And cancer uh, is unfortunate in many ways. It also can lead to a person to have more thick blood clot, blood formation, and even though a person without cancer has a normal balance and equilibrium, a person with cancer can develop a blood clot and a clotting disorder. And some other people may be missing some protein. So it's highly, highly important for uh, someone to be very compliant with their blood thinning medicines uh, because you want to reduce your risk of seeing Dr. Jankowitz or myself. With a certain pathology, and I say, oh, well, why did this person have a blood thinner? Uh, well, somebody didn't start it, or the person wasn't compliant on it. So that's what we are here for. Uh, blood sugar is also a very important, high blood sugar is very toxic, and it causes a pro inflammatory condition to the blood vessels that contributes to the narrowing uh, and or blockage of some of these big blood vessels, medium sized blood vessels. And small and high blood pressure is uh, something also that's very, very uh, toxic to the blood vessels because it impacts the blood vessels from inside the blood vessel walls, and over time it feeds out the blood vessel. And high blood pressure is one of the highest risks for causing the intracranial hemorrhages uh, affecting these very, very tiny blood vessels, but they can be so devastating. We, we want to have plenty of time for questions, so I'm going to ask you to just to, to blaze through these last couple slides, sure. just focusing on the highlights. Uh, main thing is compliance with medication, follow up with your primary doctor, 
And you want to make sure that if you are walking around with high blood pressure, you really want to work with your primary doctor to get a target of at least 130 over 80. Um, so that way you reduce the, the secondary negative effects of high blood pressure. And you know, it's too often I, I have patients come in and say, Doc, I'm doing so great. I've, I've achieved my goal. My blood pressure is 130 over 80, 125 over 75. I'm sorry. For those who've had a stroke or, or, or have a lot, uh, quite a few risk factors, their blood pressure can't be low enough. Your cholesterol can't be low enough. What we're learning is that the lower your blood pressure, the lower your cholesterol, the lower your, your serum glucose and A1C, the better you, you are for the long term. So there is no one definitive achievement that you're trying to that you're trying to assess or achieve. You want everything as, as low as possible. And usually a person, when they start blood pressure medicine or sugar lowering medicine, it's unfortunately a lifelong process because don't get lulled into a situation where you ignore the, the medicines. Uh, you want to be compliant and you want to. We advocate for aerobic exercise. We're not talking about marathons, but at least eight to 10,000 steps uh, a day walking around, eat better. Um, a very smart person once told me that eat everything in moderation. I, I value her opinion tremendously. Um, there's also different diets, Mediterranean diet, uh, also a low glucose diet or removing enough of the carbohydrates. Um, and the losing weight all is part of that altogether. But I think Dr. Jankowitz and I will agree, smoking is probably the most, one of the most significant uh, risk factors that leads to narrowing of the blood vessels in the neck and in the brain. It also infects the heart and all the other systems. Uh, so be involved in your treatment plan and decisions, take the medications as prescribed and join a program that includes exercise, education and counseling. After a stroke, what happens, you, we will work with physical therapy, occupational therapy, a speech language pathologist, physical medicine rehabilitation, a neurologist, neurocritical care, neurosurgeon, social work, and ultimately the goal is to obtain. At the JFK Johnson Rehabilitation Institute, delivering nationally comprehensive care is about clinical excellence, perseverance, family. It's also about achievement, the future of medicine, dedication, and caring. Our comprehensive care is about advancing what's possible. JFK Johnson, your rehabilitation partner for nearly 50 years. There are many hospitals that have a way to build into the hospital. We have a 100 bed rehab institute as part of JFK. Some would call it the, the strongest stroke rehab institute in the entire state of New Jersey. I certainly do. But to have the ability to have our patients be evaluated, treated, and then go right to a stroke rehab all in the same building, a place where we can continue to follow them uh, as an inpatient when they're in, the, in rehab, I think just offers a, a, a continuity of care lacking in most centers. Absolutely. Uh, much like anything, if somebody injures their arm, breaks their arm, person can't just go back to work. They need that recovery. Um, much after a large stroke where we are removing a clot, a person needs the time to strengthen their muscles, retrain their brain. And we talk about stroke recovery sometimes occurring immediately, but that's not the typical response. Sometimes you need 90 days, three months, and longer with continued physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. The brain is a very plastic organ uh, that we continue to, to be allowed by. So uh, the nice part of seeing our patients from the moment they come inside the, the hospital and following them up in clinic is we see the tremendous benefit, uh, especially when they have people in a, in a very family-oriented, supportive way of saying, don't give up. It's going to get better. We've seen it. Just continue to do what you do. Uh, this is our wonderful team at, at JFK who you'll meet. Uh, hopefully you'll never meet us, but who you will meet uh, through the emergency room or in clinic. Now in the middle is uh, uh, Bridget, uh, our nurse practitioner and our fellows who are flanking us. 
Thank you very much for your time, and thank you for joining today uh, on, on this very important topic that's uh, near and dear to our heart and we're passionate about. And you know we're passionate because you'll see the same smiling faces at four in the morning uh, on any given day. Uh, we, if we have some time, we'd love to answer questions. Thank you both again. Right now, it looks like we do not have any questions. If you do have any questions, you can go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type it there, and then we will be able to answer it live for you. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen now so we can address them. Unfortunately, you know, we, we went through um, all the all the things that 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 lead to a, a better recovery. Um, anything in particular that you didn't get a chance to really harp on? I think not uh, stopping smoking is essential to giving people the best chance at at living a stroke-free life, whether primarily or from a recurrent stroke. Um, anything about diet or exercise or, or medications that that you just want to. Uh, lend another word of support to? Sure, I, I really am a firm believer in uh, the, the compliance with uh, medication, especially blood thinning medication, especially if somebody has a reason for it. And some of those reasons could be that the, the person's ejection fraction is 30% uh, or less, or if you have a known atrial fibrillation, um, or if you have a known protein that's missing and you know that you develop blood clots. Sometimes it's, it, I know it's tiring to stay on those medicines and it can be costly, uh, but oftentimes it's more uh, efficient and, and less costly to stay on the medicines because you're, you're so protected and you'll never need somebody like myself and Dr. Jankowitz to do anything about that blood clot. Yeah, you know, sometimes I think about as, as profound as the work we do is, it's just such a small percentage of that patient's recovery process. You know, we do a surgical procedure that lasts minutes to an hour, but then it takes days to months to years after that to maximize their recovery. So we play one very small role, and, and I feel privileged to have such a such a, a large team on the back on the front end bringing the patients to us, and certainly on the back end, like our rehab institute, to really take over from there and do all and do all those things to ensure that we never have to see the patients again. We do have one question from an attendee. Do you recommend a calcium score? Uh, a calcium score, that's a, it's a great question. Um, so the correlate to that sometimes is when we have somebody that has a high grade narrowing in their blood vessels that is either in their neck or their brain, I will often say to them, please follow up with a cardiologist, because if you have an arrowing in the neck or the brain, then for sure your body has demonstrated the ability to narrow down a blood vessel in the heart. So that calcium score is very specific to the heart, uh, but it's, it's very important then to, if you don't have a cardiologist, to then follow up and do a stress test do those necessary stepwise evaluations because we certainly have had patients that have overlapping high-grade narrowing here plus a high-grade narrowing here. So that's a, a very astute question to whoever asked that. Do we have any other questions from the audience? You can put them in the Q&A feature. While we wait, I will tell you the uh, if also very important if someone or your family member and say you know what i'm either getting short of breath or i'm feeling my heart rate racing and they've never had any known atrial fibrillation then it, it's maybe worthwhile to educate them and say why don't you go to your primary doctor get an ekg or uh, talk about that with your primary doctor because more often than not we identify patients and one of my favorite questions to ask either the patient or the family is what was the like before. So I have a sort of a hint at did they feel something coming on? Was there something that could have been caught before they got to this point? Because oftentimes atrial fibrillation is not really identified until a problem is identified, like a stroke. And that's why I liken the blood clot to a spitball. 
because the atrial fibrillation allows blood to sort of stagnate in the heart for a few minutes and or seconds, and it can form a clot that then gets thrown up to the brain. And then because the person's not able to do a certain function, that's how they get recognized and then they get brought to the hospital. So that the, uh, the nice part of some of the watches that we have, the technology, it also monitors your heart rate and even the rhythm. So the technology is really getting better to the point that you may not even need Dr. Jankowitz or I. On that note, <laughs> before he says anything else that's compromising, uh, we will bid you adieu, farewell. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, if you need us, you know where to find us. Thank you. Thank you.